Welcome to MA3D1, the Warwick Maths module on fluid dynamics. This video is about constitutive laws. In order to understand the need for or the role of constitutive laws, let's start with a brief background and a recap. So far we have derived laws of conservation for any continuum quantity and applied it to mass, momentum, and angular momentum. And uh, we have also looked at the uh, deformation of uh, infinitesimal fluid elements and how to quantify it. The results are roughly as follows. The deformation rate tensor quantifies whether or how and how much an infinitesimal fluid element is deforming with time. Mass conservation is written here and can be interpreted in the following way. If you know the current density field and if you know the current velocity, then you can calculate this term and that gives you the rate of change of density if I take it on the other side. And if I know these two quantities, if I know the velocity at all future times, then I can use this relation to also sort of step my density from the current time to the next time to the next time and so on. In other words, this is a differential equation that one can solve if the velocity were known. I'm going to interpret the result from momentum conservation in a similar manner. This equation I'm going to interpret as an equation for du dt, the rate of change of Eulerian velocity, the rate of change of this velocity. If I know the current velocity, I can evaluate that term. I absolutely need to know as part of the problem, what are the external volumetric forces acting on uh, my fluid. If I don't know that, I cannot make progress because then the problem is not specified, the situation is not specified. So in order to specify the situation, I need to know the volumetric forces, which should be provided as part of the problem. And then I'm left with the divergence of the stress tensor. So suppose that I knew the stress tensor now and for all subsequent times, then I can evaluate this quantity also. I can take the spatial divergence. Then using this equation, I can solve for del u del t. And if I know the current velocity, I can march in time using the rate of change to find the future velocity. In other words, this is a differential equation for evolving the velocity with time. But the only problem, oh, by the way, uh, if I know the velocity and I know the density, then it's automatic to, uh, it's uh, the, the, the condition for Evolving density is automatically satisfied. You have now computed the velocity which goes in the rate of change of density. There is a special case here of incompressible flow which we will discuss a few minutes later. But uh, so the only problem with our plan in using these equations as a predictive tool for future flow, for subsequent flow, for the evolution of flow is knowing the stress tensor. So if somehow we knew the stress tensor, then we could do all this. Angular momentum only furnishes one other constraint on the stress tensor, that it be symmetric, which is fine, but it doesn't tell you how to find the stress tensor itself. And this is where constitutive laws enter the picture. All right. The constitutive laws uh, state that the stresses that develop within a fluid are a result of the flow itself. In fact, the general, the most general statement of a constitutive law is the relation between the components of stress and the components of uh, the deformation rate tensor and uh, possibly the density. Right? So let's see why is that. In fact, this is the type of relation that would separate different materials. This is, a, this is the equation that separates fluids like air and water, 
from fluids like toothpaste in shaving foam and other fluids like ice in some, in some circumstances when it flows. So this video is about some of the simplest constitutive laws uh, and also the uh, analysis underlying their derivation. By the way, it is worth mentioning that these laws are called constitutive laws because they mathematically represent the constitution of the fluid. And uh, in quite a many situations, you can use the uh, microstructure of the fluid to derive this relation between stress and deformation rate. So that's the origin of the name. One of the simplest constitutive laws, in fact the simplest constitutive law, is that of an ideal fluid. For an ideal fluid, the components of stress are given in terms of the fluid pressure with this relation. Here delta Ij is the Kronecker delta, it's the second rank tensor that we uh, saw in the preliminaries and it is one of the ice, uh, it is the isotropic representation of a, uh, a second rank tensor. Uh, with this form for the stress tensor, now we can calculate the divergence of the stress and substitute that in the law of conservation of momentum. Uh, it's the law of conservation of momentum is written in two forms here, one with the density multiplying the rate of change of velocity and second without the factor of density, so dividing by that factor of density. Both these equations or either of them are called Euler equation for an ideal fluid and these equations represent the, obviously the conservation of momentum for an ideal fluid. In this way we have now translated the problem from knowing the six components of the symmetric stress tensor to just knowing one scalar function the fluid pressure. So how does one go about determining the fluid pressure? The answer depends on whether your flow is compressible or incompressible. If your flow is compressible then you have to know how the pressure changes with the state, with the thermodynamic state of the fluid. And one of the simplest possibilities is that pressure changes only with density. That is P is a function of rho in which case the system is closed because we already have an equation for the evolution of density with time. So once you know the initial density, we can calculate the initial pressure and then evolve both density and the velocity to subsequently calculate the pressure which would then only depend on the density. Examples of this are limited but they do exist. Um, for example, you could have an isothermal gas, a gas whose temperature is constant, uh, the ideal gas satisfies for example P equals rho RT. So if the temperature is constant and R is the gas constant, so that's also constant, you have pressure proportional to density. Or in a, a more useful, more applicable situation is of an isentropic gas. An isentropic gas is one in which the temperature is not held constant but any sort of compression of a fluid element gives rise to a rise in temperature in accordance with maintaining the entropy of that gas element constant. This is a, uh, you can learn more about it in thermodynamics. Uh, it's not the central um, feature of this module, but it's worth mentioning that in that case, the uh, pressure depends on the density as a power law with some exponent M. A far more common situation is when pressure changes with both density and another thermodynamic variable such as temperature. And in that case, one has to consider P as, as a function of rho and T separately and derive a separate equation for the evolution of temperature using something like the law of conservation of energy. Uh, the way to derive this equation is uh, it closely follows our conservation uh, law analysis as we applied it to mass 
and momentum and angular momentum, but now we will apply it to energy. Deri derivation of this equation is outside the scope of this module at the moment. Um, so, uh, but this is, uh, for example, you could look at any of the text, reference text that I have mentioned uh, to, to see a derivation. The situation for incompressible flows is slightly different. In this case, one has to calculate or determine the pressure self-consistently with the condition that the divergence of the velocity is zero at all times. In order to better understand this, we are going to take a small and infinitesimal time step delta t. And if you know the current velocity, u now, very, very um, creatively named, uh, then one can add a small multiple of the rate of change times the time interval to give you a future velocity. And the rate of change here comes from the Euler equation. Now, to determine p self-consistently means the following. Even if you started with a divergence-free velocity, which means the divergence of the current velocity is zero, there is no guarantee that either because of the body force term or because of the advection term, the future velocity will also be divergence-free. So the role of pressure here is to come and insert itself in such a way that this sum becomes divergence-free so that when it is added to a divergence-free velocity or if the current velocity for whatever reason is not divergence-free, then also correct <coughs> the divergence of the current velocity and force it to be zero. So the pressure P is picked in such a way that the future velocities are all divergence-free. One of my mentors uh, made an analogy of the pressure with a kind of internal uh, police system which enforces divergence of uh, a velocity being zero. So let's consider a situation. Let me draw a simple picture to illustrate that. So suppose you have a small element which for which the divergence of velocity is not zero. The velocity on all four walls is such that they're all collapsing. And therefore, the volume of this element would be shrinking. But what pressure does is it comes in, I'm going to draw pressure in red, red and immediately exerts a force that counteracts this agency, whichever agency is causing this element to collapse. And by counteracting that, the internal fluid pressure would exert a force like in the uh, uh, drawn with red arrows. It will uh, overcome the tendency of external forces or of external dynamics to shrink the volume of a fluid element. That's what one physically means by determining P self-consistently. I want to close this subsection of an ideal fluid by mentioning that an ideal fluid is an inviscid fluid. Now, in reality, there are no ideal fluids, all right? Uh, even fluids like liquid helium, which is a superfluid, it exists in a mixture with a viscous fluid. Uh, so we have uh, an idealization of real fluids to be an ideal fluid, and that idealization agrees with making the fluid inviscid or setting its viscosity to zero. Uh, we are going to see this explicitly when we discuss the constitutive law for a viscous fluid, but it, w it is worth mentioning now what the, um, what the role of an ideal fluid or what the idealization underlying an ideal fluid really is. It's simply taking uh, the fluid viscosity to zero. The next constitutive law that we are going to 
going to consider and perhaps the most important one for this module is the Newtonian fluid or the Newtonian constitutive law. Now this is closely related to the ideal fluid in the sense that we have the stress tensor components have one term that are given by the pressure times delta ij just like in the ideal fluid but to that we add another second uh, rank tensor called the deviatoric stress or the viscous stress denoted sigma ij and just as the total stress tij was a function of the deformation rate tensor and the density here now we have transferred that dependence uh, or here the, our unknown is now uh, translated to the components of the deviatoric stress sensor sigma ij that we expect to depend on the deformation rate tensor and some thermodynamic quantities like the density now for a newtonian fluid newton uh, tacitly made certain assumptions okay and those assumptions apply to this relation. How does one find the deviatoric stress tensor in terms of other flow quantities? His first assumption was that of linearity. And what that means is that the component of the stress tensor depend linearly on the components of the rate of deformation or rate of shear tensor. And we kind of saw this in the definition of a fluid where we uh, said that for a Newtonian fluid, the shear stress was proportional to the shear rate. This is the tensorial version of it. Excuse me, I don't know what happened. This is the tensorial version of it. Here, the constant of proportionality is not simply a scalar viscosity, but it's a fourth rank tensor. And it's a constant in the sense that it is it does not change with either uh, strength of the deformation rate tensor or with spatial coordinates or anything. It's just a constant for a given fluid. Uh, in fact, fluids like toothpaste violate this principle of linearity. Right? For a fluid like toothpaste, the stress tensor, is, the deviatoric stress tensor is not simply a linear function of the deformation rate tensor. But in, for a Newtonian fluid like water, oil, or air, or honey, that relation is very well satisfied. The second, and perhaps the most interesting and the most important uh, condition imposed on a Newtonian constitutive law is that of isotropy. Now, it's worth pausing here and taking a minute to understand what isotropy, what isotropy means. So suppose there are two users, two students like yourselves, who are both analyzing a given flow. But one of you chooses a coordinate system in which the x and the y axis are aligned in a particular way. And the second of you chooses a different coordinate system. Your x and y axes, x, y, z axes, z axes, are not aligned. Now, for a general tensor, and in this case, a fourth rank tensor, the components of your tensor will depend on the coordinate system that you have chosen. But fluids like water or air or oil, they don't care about which direction you have chosen to be your x-axis and so on. So, it stands to reason that somehow the components of this fourth rank tensor are independent of the choice of the coordinate system. And therefore, one would say that the components of this fourth rank tensor, uh, or the, this fourth rank tensor, is isotropic, which means you are safe to align your coordinate system in whichever way you like, and you would still have the same values for the components of these tensors, of this fourth rank tensor, which characterizes the fluid. So it so happens that it is possible to write the most general isotropic fourth rank tensor 
in terms of three scalar constants, lambda, alpha, and beta. And you can look at the, uh, th this in fact, I'm going to state without proof, and it's also stated without proof in the preliminaries. And now substitute this in the constitutive, the linear relation between the stress and the deformation uh, rate tensor. I'm going to show you how this substitution is done for one of the terms. So let's consider alpha delta im delta jn times emn from there. Now here you notice that this is, these are the components of fourth rank tensor, second rank tensor, but there is a contraction. There is a dot product of the m with the m there and the n with the n there. Those are repeated indices. And one, the property of the dot product with the delta, so for example, if I consider the second one, delta jn, delta jn is equal to zero when j is not equal to n and is equal to one when j is equal to n. And there is the sum over n. So three values of n are possible, n equals one, two, or three. But only one of them is not non-zero, the one that corresponds to n equals j. And therefore, the term that survives is emj. And similarly, if I do for, oh, let me write that actually, delta i m e m j. And I can do the same thing for the second uh, delta i m. Here there's the sum over m. The only term that survives is the one when m is equal to i. And therefore, this term is alpha delta i j. Mm -hmm. So, in the next line, I have now written down, I've done this for every term, all the three, for each of these three terms in the definition of A, I, J, M, N. And you get uh, this as the constitutive law, sigma I, J, the first term depending on lambda, plus the two terms uh, involving alpha and beta they combine into a single term because of the symmetry of EIJ, okay? And it's also worth noting, and we are going to assume this from this point onwards, that our fluid is incompressible. Therefore, we take EMM, which is, this, which is the trace of the deformation rate tensor, and we saw in our deformation of fluid elements that the trace of the deformation rate tensor is equal to the divergence of velocity and it is related to the incompressibility condition. So if your fluid is incompressible, this trace is zero. So we got rid of that term. And now we simply have sigma ij being proportional to eij. It's an immense simplification with a single constant of proportionality. Note that alpha and beta being independent does not matter here in, anymore. It's only their sum that matters. And this coefficient is now conveniently determined by comparing, by applying this constitutive relation for all the six independent components of the stress to the six independent components of strain rate or deformation rate to the Newtonian situation, in which case you can write down the velocity field, the components of the velocity field. You can do the differentiation to get the deformation rate tensor you can also write down the deviatoric stress tensor, the components of the deviatoric stress tensor, and equate and use this relation for the Newtonian constitutive law, which we applied to this Newtonian case. But then if you apply this to the more general tensorial relation, you find that this constant alpha plus beta is nothing but equal, but is related to mu. It is in fact equal to two mu, two times the Newtonian viscosity. And therefore, if I substitute the deformation rate tensor, then I, ha I get, or one gets, the deviatoric stress tensor in terms of the gradients of velocity. And in doing so, this closes uh, the system for uh, evolving velocity. Now, what follows is similar to what we did for um, the ideal fluid. So where we calculated next the, uh, the divergence of the 
total stress and we follow the same process here to find that the divergence of the stress consists of two terms, a gradient of pressure, which we also obtained in the ideal fluid, and a second term which is proportional to fluid viscosity times the Laplacian of velocity. You can follow this derivation here in index notation where it is most convenient. And substituting this in the conservation of momentum now yields uh, the so-called the celebrated Navier-Stokes equation. So this equation, conservation of momentum along with conservation of mass together are called the Navier-Stokes equation. The Navier-Stokes equations have the following terms or the terms within the uh, Navier-Stokes equation have the following names. The left hand side which comes from density times acceleration that is called the inertial term. The inertial term includes the density. The second of the inertial term, the one that comes from uh, the fact that we are in an Eulerian uh, description, but we want the Lagrangian derivative, the u dot grad, and the term that involves the material derivative, is called the advection term. The gradient of pressure is an imaginatively called the pressure gradient. Rho g we have seen is the body force term. And the final term that comes from the Newtonian character of the fluid is the viscous stress term. Uh, I invite you at this point to pause and write this equation in index notation, which would be the expression of, the, of this equation in Cartesian form. In fact, I'm going to write and use the Cartesian form of this equation where the velocity components are u, v, w and the coordinates are x, y, z. More often than I'm going to use the index form. But you need to be familiar with the index form to immediately realize what the Cartesian form looks like. And in closing, I would like to mention that the equation in cylindrical coordinates uh, is not trivial to derive, but the derivation and the final form is available in various references. One of the uh, convenient references for cylindrical coordinates is Wikipedia, the fountain of knowledge in the modern age. Uh, the equations on Wikipedia are not wrong, they are correct, they are verified, etc. But my personal preference is not to use the particular form in which the equations are expressed on Wikipedia. Uh, the form that I prefer are included in the lecture notes. And the advantage of the form that I have used in the lecture notes will become clear in subsequent uh, uh, lectures. So that completes the video on constitutive laws. Constitutive laws are different for different fluids. We have considered only two constitutive laws, the ideal fluid and the Newtonian viscous fluid. It should ob be obvious to you now why the ideal fluid is called the inviscid fluid, because if you set the coefficient of viscosity to zero, uh, you get the ideal constitutive law. Uh, with that, I will conclude this recording and I will see you in the next recording or in the live session.